Let's talk about interpolation and reconstruction. First, a signal, an image, or a function can be either discrete or continuous. And it's important to uh, distinguish between these two representations. For example, a tensor x that has a width, a height, and a number of channels is a discrete representation. Reconstruction refers to the uh, operation that creates a continuous function from a discrete sampled representation. So reconstruction means going from uh, discrete to continuous. Interpolation is a form of reconstruction where the samples are considered as hard constraints for the reconstructed function. So at the sample locations, the reconstructed function will exact be exactly the same as the discrete representation. Sampling is then the opposite to reconstruction. You are evaluating a continuous function at given locations. So sampling converts a continuous function to a discrete representation. And a side note is that changing the resolution has to be seen as reconstruction plus sampling. It's not properly viewed as some atomic operation that just changes the resolution. So they are, whatever you do, there are these two separate steps, first reconstruction and then sampling, and you should be able to know what these two steps are. And then as a, another side note, a pixel is in signal processing not considered as a little square, but really it's considered as a sample of a function in the middle of the pixel, if the pixel is drawn as a little square. One thing to look at is actually the uh, parametrization of the domain. So we are given a whatever image function. Uh, and so the question is, how big is the domain? For example, the domain could be defined in some canonical size. That means 0, 1 to the power of m. So for each of the dimensions, the values indexing the domain can be from 0 to 1. So what we see here is an image that has been parameterized from 0, 0 to 1, 1, so that the lower left corner is 0, 0, and the upper right corner is 1, 1, and the pixels are now somewhere inside this domain. Typically, the spacing between the pixels is constant, and the spacing this is another choice. If from a pixel, the, the last pixel to the boundary would be half of the spacing between two pixels. Again, this is a choice that can be changed, but for this two by two image, these would be the pixel coordinates. So the lower left pixel would have pixel coordinates 0 0.25, 0 0.25, and the top left one would have pixel coordinates 0 0.25, 0 0.75. Another parametrization might try to put the pixels lo pixel locations at integer coordinates. So maybe here the first pixel has coordinates 1, 1, the next one then has 2, 1, and going up 1 would be 2, 2. Then um, the question is the boundary, again, having the same idea that the spacing from a pixel to the boundary is half of the spacing between two pixels. The lower left boundary of the image would be 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and the upper right would be 2.5, 2.5. We already see there will be some trade-offs involved, and it's typically not possible to have everything nice. So. Uh, whatever design choices you make, 
some uh, things, either pixel coordinates or the boundary coordinates or something might end up being a bit ugly. So again, so here are some design choices. Should the domain boundary or the sample coordinates have integer locations? Are the samples in the center at the corner or at the corner of the grid? So we'll uh, see a counter example in the next, uh, in a different example in the next slide to what we've seen before. So uh, let's maybe look at that. So here the samples are at the corner. So here we see a three by three image inside of the domain of size zero, zero to two, two. So now let's think about these two choices. Let's say the samples are in the center of, of the grid cells. Then it's easier to deal with factors of two and it's harder to deal with the boundary. If the samples are at the corners, then there is no boundary problem, but it's harder to deal with factors of two. Now, these are some design choices. There are many different uh, versions in practice, and whatever software you use, it is important that you first check what type of conventions your software is actually using. Or it can change code uh, bases to code bases. You might have to check what a particular software that you download, what convention it's using. So now let's discuss multivariate functions since we are basically dealing with multivariate functions. So assume we choose the option to have a simple domain. So um, we are dealing with a function. Let's look at this f. And f is from 0, 1 to the power of m. So that means how many dimensions the input domain has. Uh, and then we map that to r to the power of n. So m is how many input dimensions do we have, and n is how many output dimensions do we have. So let's assume we have a function given as a tensor x. And so the tensor x represents this function from with n m dimensional inputs and n dimensional outputs. And if we now want to compute interpolation, so we want to interpolate this function f, then we also need to have a query point that tells us where we would like to interpolate, basically where we would like to query this interpolated function. And then as output, we get this n dimensional vector. And now what I give you is this tensor x and I give you the tensor x in this form with times height times the number of channels. And now there is a correct interpretation of this as a function and there is an incorrect interpretation. So, of course, that depends on the context. For now, we have these image networks with um, with, with basically a spatial resolution with times height and the number of channels C. And so here the correct interpretation is that we actually deal with functions F that have a two-dimensional input and a C-dimensional output. So the domain is two-dimensional and the output is C-dimensional. So going back to this formulation, that means M is 2 and N is capital C. Therefore, we also say that we need to perform C independent 2D interpolation steps because we deal with functions that have two dimensional input. So the incorrect interpretation would be to say, well, this is actually a volume. So what we want is we would like to have a function that has a three-dimensional input and a one-dimensional output. That means the domain is three-dimensional and the output is a scalar value. 
and this is not really correct because the channels are not really ordered and we do not want to interpolate between channels. Let's say you interpolate between the second and the third channel. Maybe you query at the position of 2.5, somewhere in the middle between the second and the third channel. Then for our image classification networks, at least, uh, this makes no sense because this third channel and the second channel have no spatial relationship. You might as well switch the second with the 117th channel. And of course, you need to shuffle some weights, but there's no relationship between neighboring channels. It's just uh, completely random. This might be a bit less true if you use something like um, uh, convolutional operations that use groups then there would be groups of channels that, that have some re more relationship to each other than channels outside of the group, but still within a group, there still wouldn't be any uh, neighborhood relationship between the channels. So now an example setup is we have this tensor X, again we have width times height times C, so as we said the correct interpretation is to think of a two-dimensional domain, and we just say the domain size goes from 0 to 1. And uh, we also make the choice that the sample locations touch the domain boundary. Then we would have this setup where uh, we ask what, what does now a tensor value at location i and j, how does that relate to this function? And so this tensor value at i and j, these are the spatial coordinates, uh, correspond to, in this zero one one parameterization, to i divided by h minus 1 and j divided by w minus 1. Again, you also get this touching the boundary, so let's just pick uh, 0 for i, then we would get 0 divided by something is 0, and if we took, pick the highest uh, thing, then we pick h minus 1, so i goes up to h minus 1, so we get h minus 1 divided by h minus 1, so this would be 1. So that means the first pixel would have this, would, would have a coordinate uh, that gives 0 here, and the last one would give it 1 here. That means that, as we said, the sample locations touch the boundary because the 0 and the 1 is achieved here. And uh, for j, we have the same thing. So the interpolation problem would be now to determine the function values for arbitrary locations f u v. Maybe u could be something like uh, 0 0.117, right, this writing, 6, 3, 5, right? And I, wanna s I want to have this for u and v is something else. Okay, what's, what's going to be the function value? All right, so that's the interpolation. So uh, we're going to look at nearest neighbor interpolation, and we'll just do nearest neighbor interpolation between two points in 1D. The input is a tensor x, uh, that's an element of r to the power of 2 cross c. That means we have uh, two spatial samples and um, each spatial sample has C values. So meaning that each spatial sample is a vector that has C dimensions. We're using this notation that means the uh, first vector is x0 and then the second coordinate can go from 0 to C minus 1. So for example, if C would be 4, then this one here would be a vector that has 4 entries. This would be x0, 0, x0, 1, x0, 2, and x0, 3. And then, same for this, this would also be a vector x1, 0, and so on and so forth with four entries.
So now we would like to get a function that is continuous that I can access anywhere from 0 to 1. And I would like, again, to get as output a C dimensional vector. And for nearest neighbor interpolation, again, there's some design choice here. But uh, for nearest neighbor interpolation, like where exactly these pixels are located, so but we'll just, it, it might not make a difference for nearest neighbor interpolation, but uh, to draw this figure, right? So we have, uh, this. let's just draw it as a coordinate. This is the T coordinate. And uh, here we have T is zero, here we have T is one. And at this location zero, we are given this vector x, 0, colon. Again, this is a c-dimensional vector. And here we have this vector x, uh, 1, again, colon. And what this equation tells us is that there's the dividing point, which is at 0 0.5. And whenever we evaluate with t smaller equals 0 0.5, then we would pick this value, x0, whatever. And whenever we are greater than 0 0.5, let's say here or here, we would evaluate and we would obtain this value. So nearest neighbor interpolation means take the value of the sample location that is nearest in the domain. Let's look at this 2D picture. Let's say we have uh, four pixels and we just look at the uh, way these four pixels would interpolate uh, or the, the values would be interpolated between these four pixels. And we see that all uh, points in the domain that would evaluate to the uh, value at this corner here, they're colored orange. So all values in the domain that are orange, they will obtain the value from this orange sample location. And all purple, uh, everything that's colored purple would get the sample value from this purple sample location. So the question is here, how do we interpolate in 2D these four samples, the green one, the purple one, the brown one, and the orange one drawn as circles, so corresponding to these corners. So these are the given sample locations. And then uh, this color coding shows us how the domain is divided. All right, let's see some examples. So this would be um, maybe down sampling and up sampling, so this might be the original, and then we do up sampling by two and down sampling by two with some nearest neighbor filter. This is an example with natural images, but uh, in general it's hard to see something because the change with a factor of two is not enough to really see significant differences. Now we look at linear interpolation. We first start in uh, 1D again. That means that the input is one dimensional to the function. So we see here again the number line. So this is a T axis. There's a parameter T that can be used to index the function. That is the continuous function. And T can be anywhere from zero to the left to one. And at this green uh, value zero, so if t is zero, then the function is defined by this tensor again. So we have x zero and whatever, depending on how many channels there are. And then for the purple point at one, the function value is given by x one and whatever, depending on the number of channels. So again, this tensor defines two c-dimensional vectors, one 
for the zero location here and one for the one location. And uh, now for any value t in between zero and one, the output f of t, that is the continuous uh, function f, is given by one minus t times the green value plus t times the purple value. So as you see, it's somewhat flipped. So let's mark this again. So this t here is multiplied with this purple value. So this purple value is x1, whatever. And then this green value here is x0 something. And so this t is used to multiply this purple because let's say t gets very 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 small so let's say t is almost zero then the influence of this uh, purple sample location will be close to zero so the extension of linear interpolation to uh, not one dimensional but two dimensional domains is bilinear interpolation first problem already is that bilinear interpolation contrary to the name linear in bilinear, this, the, what you get is actually not linear functions. Because bilinear means that uh, you know two variables multiply together, so you get something that's more similar to quadratic. And um, between two neighboring sample points, bilinear interpolation reduces to linear interpolation. So what we are going to do is Conceptually, you can think of bilinear interpolation as doing two times linear interpolation. And that's one way to construct it. All right, so it's good we already know linear interpolation. So there are two ways to do this. Um, it's kind of uh, the order is arbitrary, but we said we want to do two times linear interpolation to obtain bilinear interpolation. So let's say this is the sample point or this is the point where we would like to evaluate the function so this is at position f t v where the coordinate t is in this direction and v is in the down direction all right so now first we linear in, li, 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 li interpolate between the green and the purple point here and we linearly interpolate to obtain a value here. And then we linearly interpolate between orange and brown. And we will obtain a value here. And then we will linearly interpolate between this temp, let's say this is some temporary value. I just give it the number one, and this is a temporary value two. Then we linearly interpolate between one and two, and then we obtain this here. So um, we say two successive linear interpolations, but in computation-wise, it's actually three uh, because we need to linearly interpolate twice in the t direction and then once in the v direction. All right, that's pretty much the same. Let's just go to the equations. So we have these four values at the corners, and these values at the corners are x, 0, 0, and then whatever, depending on the number of channels, x, 1, 0, x, 0, 1, and x, 1, 1. So as we said before, we, we do two times linear polish, in linear interpolation in the x direction, and so, or the t direction, sorry. So what we're doing is we get these two temporary values, temp0 and temp1. Again, just as a sanity check, sanity check temp0 and temp1 are both c-dimensional vectors. And they are obtained by the equation for linear interpolation. So we have 1 minus t times this vector plus t times this vector. And also again, x, 0, 0, whatever, is a c-dimensional vector. All right, second equation. 
is uh, the same, just with different corners. And then we interpolate in the up top, we interpolate top to bottom, so we get 1 minus v times temp 0, where temp 0 was computed up here, and v times temp 1, where temp 1 was computed here. One can also write this in a few different forms. So, for example, combining all these equations, one would say that, okay, see that, okay, we get 1 minus v, okay, so 1 minus v times temp 0, and now for temp 0 we replace this complete equation, so we get like this, and then plus v times, so plus, this is here, uh, temp 1, and for temp 1 we replace this equation. Uh, it's possible to use this form, or there's another form. Uh, I just didn't want to use broadcasting because this makes it a bit unclear what exactly happens. If uh, So, basically there would be one such equation for each of the channels i. So, i here would go from 0 to c minus 1. And for each of these channels, there would be this uh, equation. So, there is 1 m minus v, v. This is a row vector. Then there's the matrix that has the four uh, corner values. And then there's the column vector 1 minus t, t. By matrix uh, associativity, you can do the multiplication in any order. There are a few visual examples, but I'm going to skip them for now. One important parameter is this aligning corners in PyTorch. So if you're doing some upsampling, then uh, there is a flag that you can set if you want to align the corners or not. So aligning the corners means that the um, old and the new sample values will be uh, overlapped on the corners, and um, if you look at the line corners is false, then the old and the new sample values are not aligned at the corners. In these figures, uh, the sample values are the small blue circles and the large white circles. Let's look at some PyTorch commands. Let's say I generate some input tensor that looks as follows. So this is, now let's just say this is a tensor and we think of this as a 2x2 uh, two two matrix or a 2x2 two two image that has the values 1, 2, 3, 4 in this spatial order. Now if I do upsampling with a scale factor of 2, and nearest neighbor sampling, then we would expect that each of these values will be replicated into a 2x2 two two sub image subgrid. So, for example, this 2 here, this corresponds then to this 2 by this, these values here in the output, and if we think of this 3 here in the input, then this corresponds to this 2x2 two two subgrid. All right, so now let's look at something uh, trickier. We are going to do upsampling with a factor of 2, and we are doing bilinear, and this has uh, aligning corners is false. So um, again, the input is this 2 by 2 matrix with the values 1, 2, 3, 4. But now, if we look at the output, we want to just see how do the values get interpolated between 1 and 2, and then we look at the first row of the output. So we get 1, 1 1.25, 1.75, and 2. Okay, first complaint if we look at the spacing between the values, this seems to be a bit off. 
So between here and here, we have a spacing of 0 0.25. And uh, between here and here, there's a spacing of 0 0.5. We also, um, we look at the corners, so here the corner was 1, here the corner is also 1, and there's another corner, 2, 2, so it seems like, uh, why are these corners not aligned? And uh, the problem is that the sampling pattern is such that um, the sample values here are taken on the outside, so they're taken further out than this sample value 1. But since there is nothing there, and you cannot really uh, bilinearly interpolate outside of the sample grid, you snap to the nearest value in the sample grid, and then you get this 1. So that's somewhat uh, uh, not really desirable thing that happens here. Or at least maybe we should say uh, this a bit more carefully. This is something you really need to make sure that you want, or you really need to make sure to handle this correctly if you use this. All right, now let's do align the corners and see what happens with uh, bilinear interpolation here. Again, we see that the corners are kind of the same, like one, two three and four but now the sample spacing is no longer off it's one third one third one third and also here the sample spacing is two thirds two thirds two thirds so uh, the sample spacing seems to be consistent also we can observe that right so this is linearly interpolated here this is again one third, one third, one third, and then even interpolated here again we have two thirds, two thirds, two thirds. So uh, we can kind of verify that this bilinear interpolation scheme really makes sense here. This is much closer to what we conceptually learned. Okay, so now let's look at some input uh, three by three matrix. It has the values 1, 2, 3, 4, like before, but to that we add a column and a row of zeros. What we're going to do... So what we're going to do here is we're going to do a bilinear interpolation with align corners equals false. All right, let's look at the output. All right, so we have the one here that was here before. And now we look in the first row. And first thing we notice is that the two is gone. But we still have a zero here. And uh, also when we go down, so the three seems to be missing. We just have the zero and we have this zero. So what we see is that this locations where the value was 2, 3, and 4, they were not hit by any sample here. Also spacing, 1 fourth, 1 half, minus 1 fourth, minus 1, minus 1 half. So, um, we would kind of like to know where are these sample points actually placed. Let's just look at the first row maybe. So here we had a 1. We have a 2. And here we have a 0. So just looking at these values, we can now reconstruct where these sample values were placed.
and the old sample values I draw with these dots and the new I will draw with axes. Alright, so 1.25 has to be placed here so that it's uh, dividing the space between 1 and 2 into 4 quarters and that's at the first quarter. Then this 1.75 is placed here. So um, basically the pixel spacing here is uh, one half, right? So here the pixel spacing is one. So then we draw again two and zero is also placed, is also divided into four quarters. This is at the one quarter, this is at the three quarter mark. And now we have uh, four values, but we need six. And so the trick is that there will be another one with sample spacing uh, between here and here is going to be one half. There will another sample tap here. All right, so, so this x here corresponds to this zero. This x here corresponds to this 1.0, 1.5, sorry, and then maybe this x here corresponds to 1.75. And again, what is the big problem? The big problem is this x here that's basically placed at um, the location to the left of this input point, and it cannot do linear interpolation out here, so it snaps to the 1 location and it gets this value 1. By contrast, we can do align corners is true. And so what we can see here is that um, right, we still have this one here and this zero here, but the interpolation pattern will be different. And similar to before, you can calculate where the sample, new sample values were placed. And so since align corners is true, if we are starting again with one sample, two samples, three samples. Here the value is one, here the value is two, and here the value is zero. Then now all these four will be equally spaced. The new sample tabs will be equally spaced between as well, since align corners is true, there will be axes perfectly aligned with the boundary.